Okay. Brilliant. Mira, thank you so much for joining me to tear up the Good Girl script. I am particularly excited to be having this conversation with you because we've known each other for a long time and I've been very privileged to witness your work. First of all, being the director of Academy, South Asian Dance in the UK, and really pioneering the mainstreaming of South Asian dance here in the UK. I wanted to take the opportunity to publicly acknowledge that, the fact that you have been in that leadership role and that you've also pioneered something. The work of pioneering is very, very hard work. <laughs> Thank you very much, Vina. So bear in mind that the Good Girl script is the one that essentially says you shouldn't be doing that because you're a girl. It relates to how we dress, how we speak, how we sit, um, how we aspire. What do you remember of the good girl script as you were growing up? You know, funnily, when I woke up uh, today in the morning, um, I suddenly kind of realized that the word good girl, it comes into, it has recently arrived into my life through the dog, actually. <laughs> so we have, we have Kulfi, who's a totally kind of, you know, um, who, who is all the time misbehaving and then she's given a treat and she it, it takes that treat and she takes she rolls on the floor twice and then she gets up stands up and we say good girl and she's very happy mm. so that was one good girl which sort of really is happening nowadays in our life which is hilarious and she does all sorts of drama to have that treat just to just to kind of prove that she's a good girl and then um, the last time I was called a good girl was uh, when I uh, when I had just arrived in this country and a very patronizing racist, I would call, um, manager of a bookshop uh, who um, hired me and I did something. And of course, she could see that I was new in the country. And she said, good girl. And I, th I thought, my God, I've had... I mean, you know, I've been in the same kind of really situation as that dog. <laughs> no. I was born in Belgrade in Yugoslavia and I, um, my parents were working for government of India and I had a, I had a Serbian maid and she had her own views about how the good girl should look and dress up and her own values. But Militsa kind of really controlled me and my mother allowed her to kind of work uh, on me. But very soon, by the time I was four and a half, five, I found myself in a town in India where everything was free for me because this town was my grandparents' home, my maternal home, um, where I could run around the streets without mm. shoes, you know, with, without wearing shoes. And so it was that freedom. And then I turned up in Delhi. Delhi was this uh, city of paradoxes because... The good girl scenario in the capital of India, which was um, the seat of power. And, and you have to also remember that this is the time when flower power was happening. This is late 60s and early 70s. Um, at the same time, I was put into a school called Lady Irwin School by my very um, ambitious but and Gandhian mother. So Lady Evan did not have any school dress. We could wear anything in that school. And our, uh, um, our principal said that, you know, she were, that we were like individual flowers of her garden. Oh, we had wow. our own look. We had our own look. We had our own smell. We had our own personalities. She didn't want soldiers in the school, you know. Mm. And, in, and in that sort of really environment, as I was getting, I was growing up, the only expectation from my mother uh, for me to be a good girl was to get good marks and right. prepare for a career. And being a rebel, I was not interested in doing that. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> but there was an underbelly of Delhi, um, which was my peer group. Girls who were kind of really um, uh, studying in my class. So though it was a Bengali school and there was a lot of Tagore happening and we were just prancing around on Tagore music and doing kind of <laughs> lovey-dovey stuff there. Um, but, most of the students of that school were children of the refugees who had come from Punjab uh, after partition. So after, there was after partition. After partition. So right. and you know you have to remember this is after 20, 21 years of yeah. Indian independence. It was very new. Mm -hmm. And in that new sort of really 
uh, scenario and and of course india was the india of hope you know of course this is post sort of really lal bahadur shastri era uh, politically but we still were living through the hope and uh, through a desire to kind of really make it because we were a new country right yet you know um we had these children of the the you know they were the second generation kids who were being controlled and managed by their parents who were refugees actually they were the, the really the nested values within the within my peer group you know mm-hmm. um and which was to, to keep your eyes low cover your breast with dupatta i still come covering my breast with my dupatta hmm? mm-hmm. um, um do not laugh loud keep your eyes uh, keep your legs together mm-hmm. there was a very interesting kind of underlying kind of um, note of izzat and the words were how will i show my face muh kaise dikhaungi or they would say kahin ka nahi choda and these were the dialogues which were coming from the contemporary cinema as well you know the the women the female characters of indian cinema also kind of you know um that was a time when the women sort of uh, the titles of the indian films were mai chup rahungi means i shall remain silent hmm? um or quiet so it was those kind of really really things which were floating around where the female characters were supposed to tolerate and be sort of interesting thing was that my gandhian mother who actually kind of really editor uh, uh, who retired as an editor um of uh, actually she edited collected works of mahatma gandhi for okay. most of her life so we had very kind of strong value based sort of really life um, um by the time i went into the college you know so the most sort of really inter- important thing was that the girls did not smoke did not drink mm. um and and this was to do with morality not with the health issues of the yes. impact of that so the whole morality of the time kind of really um and every girl was um generally every girl was pre- you know being prepared to get married rather than do anything else mm. um you know the maximum you could do was to become a school teacher generally right. you know that's right so, so there's that there's that limitation in the career aspirations if you you know good girls become school teachers because that's safe um i think clothes were also kind of really one kind of really um important aspect of this whole thing and i want to just share this very funny actually experience that i grew up in um um np on the borders of maharashtra and madhya pradesh where girls uh, wear culturally flowers in their head mm-hmm. so i i knew that you know flowers were just wonderful i went to a bengali school where from the 8th standard we went we were allowed to wear sarees so girls came to school wearing sarees hmm? mm-hmm. and as well as bell bottoms and flares you know and lungis which were yeah, yeah. So everything was hap- floating happily and then while everybody was you know trying out um, fags which is uh, cigarettes i decided to eat pan <laughs> just beat okay so <laughs> I, i i'm in delhi in a punjabi delhi women young women eating pan means you are character your your character is low oh wow so by the time i was in college i was this pan chewing kind of really i used to carry box of pan as well <laughs> pan chewing kind of woman who would wear flowers in her head and wear the sari and when everybody else was wearing jeans i very happily kind of had sari and jola and um and hanged around and people were scared so some somebody said oh stay away from her she carries a knife <laughs> the girls came into my home and their male friends also came into my home in a safe scenario where my, my parents were there and kind of you know stayed on and it was like a free place you know mm. but by the time i got married mm. the script changed because um, um i was such a kind of free spirit and i was my parents decided that i might bring shame to the family and therefore the first chance they got was uh, you know um um this friend of mine whom i knew for 4 5 years he used to come sort of come home and hang around he got a job and he came home and he said mira please marry me i have to I have, i'm going to uk and my parents sort of thought ha let's get rid of her <laughs> otherwise I don't know what is in the <laughs> before i could i was 23 before i could kind of realize anything i was married and packed off and i was here in mm. in England. So let's talk let's talk about your life here particularly your professional life. What would you say is the biggest challenge that you have overcome? I don't know whether I've overcome my challenges. 
um, because while all this was happening, I did not realize, while I was growing up in India, I didn't realize I was terribly dyslexic. And that dyslexia, for whatever happened in my life, was meant I was stupid. So I did everything to hide my stupidity rather than find a way to deal with because nobody knew about it. And so I became this very streetwise kind of operator where, you know, dyslexia was sitting in the background and I was coping with it and I've coped with it throughout my life as well. Um, and now because I don't have a full-time job, you know, I can kind of very happily say that I am terribly dyslexic because I was able to do it. I could plan, I could plot, I could elucidate, I could dream, I had vision, I could do all sorts of things which nobody else was doing. And I sort of really did a lot of things and then came to work at Academy, which was the largest sort of piece of my work. Mm -hmm. But at, um, at Academy, uh, and then I very happily got sort of really settled in Academy. But still during the first 10 years, one of the biggest hurdle I had was my aesthetic. So my life with the sticker <laughs> and my life without the sticker. And so I very happily hang around without the sticker now. But, but this sticker kind of really became a major kind of really a flagship of my being, you know, and it's my British identity rather than an Indian identity because nobody wears something like this in India. Yeah. I mean, yeah. very few people wear it. It's not fashion. Yeah. And I also realized that it was only this country which could allow me to become myself. And that... And I hang, have hanged around kind of being myself as director of Academy very happily because I was related to a dance sector, a performance art sector. So I could perform with this kind of kind of makeup in my, on myself, my very rural and grounded, you know, desiness, which is kind of Indianness. All of that sort of really was a hurdle and as well as a major kind of really um, um, strength. And an, an ongoing kind of hurdle was motherhood. It was hurdle because I had to cross it. I had to jump it every time something happened. I had to kind of really, you know, be there or not be there or take tough decisions, you know, um, to kind of let my husband deal with my children. Um, and um, he dealt with their um, their body and minds most of the time. And I just with their spirits. Um, when uh, you're working with the, with the performing arts industry where, you know, uh, there's no end to your day yes. uh, because you're, you're hanging around till midnight um, watching things or delivering things, you know, shows. Mm. That was one of the major yes. issues. You touched on something really important, which is turning your weaknesses into your strengths. So you mentioned the dyslexia and the aesthetics and, and you've managed to turn those into your strengths. And this is something that when I've worked with women over the years, this is a key piece that keeps coming up because those things that we perceive as weaknesses, um, when you learn to turn them into your strength, that is what makes you stand out and that is what makes you unique. So, you know, you referenced your bindi and it is something that we very much associate with you because that, it, you know, you did, you wore it as a prop, as a piece of makeup very, very effectively. And it became really part of your brand, I would say. It's very recognizable. So what would you um, say are your top couple of tips? I've spoken my mind very freely without caring and, and of course suffered it. You know, I was stood up for my sort of really, you know, issues and causes. Also, I've created kind of my own safety nets to deal with the consequences of my act. Also, uh -huh. always. Yeah. Um, create your own protect, protection, your shields around you. Uh, be aware of your protection. Um, a financial, I would say, keep a separate bank account mm -hmm. um, from anyone uh, which you can manage. Uh, spiritually, I think you need to follow. Um, you don't need to follow others. You need to really believe in yourself and follow which makes you feel protected. Ensure that your mind, body and spirit are actually protected and everything you do on your own terms. Wonderful. That is very clear. I love that clarity. Thank you so much, Mira. Um, and what you said about providing the safety net and setting up those supports is particularly important for women who are in leadership positions. Thank you so much for sharing your very, very rich journey and I, your amazing insights. I've learned a lot about you that I didn't know today. So I've really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is going to be inspiring for many.
Thank you, Rina, and love you.